Well, this, this presentation, I'm going to argue, um, it, this is more of a, of a legalistic talk that we've been hearing, partly because I'm not a sociologist, um, that the Court of Justice of the EU and the Supreme Court of the United States share more features uh, than it may appear at first, yet they feel so different. As, um, and I'm going to try to talk both about the similarities and why, despite the fact that they're in the business of doing largely the same thing, it feels so different. Um, as for the similarities, they're both constitutional courts and became so by asserting their authority to be so. Um, the U.S. court did so in Marbury versus Madison in the 18th century. The Court of Justice asserted its authority in several cases in the first decade of this century. I'm going to point to two differences in the judicial cultures in an effort to explain why the two courts doing more or less the same thing can do so in such different ways. The first has been noticed, which has been noticed by many, is the common law background of the U.S. court and the civil law background of the European court. Although the EU contains both civil law and common law jurisdictions as member states, uh, the court was founded at a time when all of the members were civil law jurisdictions and it maintains that culture. The second um, issue, um, which I think is less important but another, nevertheless real, is the multilingual nature of the, um, of the European Union and it, in, its, in its lawmaking and the interpretation by the courts. If you want to um, cite a precedent and then quote the precedent, which I'm going to be talking about later, you don't know what to quote because the language of the case could be uh, Romanian, <laughs> the judges operate in French, and, um, and everybody pretends that they don't care about English. <laughs> so it's, um, it's very difficult to know what it is that you're going to quote if the gist of the opinion is going to be the same across languages and versions, but the language could be quite different. Um, now, I used the expressions common law background and civil law background intentionally. Neither court is a common law court, um, at least not formally. Other than the law of admiralty, there's very little federal common law decided by the Supreme Court of the United States. Rather, the Supreme Court judges the constitutionality of state and federal governmental action and is the final word on the interpretation of both the Constitution and of federal laws and regulations. That's what those justices do for a living. The activities of the Court of Justice are similar enough. It determines whether the member states have met their obligations under the various treaties that are the basic documents of the EU and construes the EU, EU law when, when disputes arise as to what the law requires. Both courts cite judicial decisions, especially their own, in performing these tasks. Um, American courts are, are more narcissistic in ways that I'll, 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 I'll describe later. Now, in 1997, the late Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia published a book entitled A Matter of Interpretation. And in it, he described the fact, he he, I'm sorry, he decried the fact that although most of the work of that court involves the interpretation of statutes, regulations, and the Constitution, judges have tended to adhere to their common law roots, taking the liberty to make decisions that they deem to be the best for developing the law, rather than adhering to the will of the legislature or the framers of the Constitution. If an accurate description, it's fair criticism. His point was that the US, as, as the U.S. moves toward being a civil law system, judges must begin <coughs> to act more like civil law judges. Scalia derided judges and scholars for relying too heavily on extra textual evidence in construing laws. His most prominent villain was legislative history, largely the reports of legislative committees that describe in more detail than the laws themselves the plan of the legislatures that enact the laws. He also fired some shots at judicial reliance on a law's purpose, claiming correctly, at least to some extent, that the overall purpose of a statute is often tempered by what the lawmakers decide not to do. For example, if one believes that increasing the length of a criminal sentence bears a linear, inverse relationship to the likelihood of the prescribed acti activity will occur, then a criminal law that carries a sentence of five years in prison accomplishes its goal to, the, to deter a criminal activity only to the extent that five years deters the activity. Ten years may accomplish the goal more fully, perhaps at the expense of proportionality, and two years would not accomplish the goal as well. In one case, he remarked in his opinion for a majority, as we have observed before, the purpose of a statute includes not only what it sets out to change, but also what it resolves to leave alone. <coughs> 
Civil law scholars and judges may be surprised at Scalia's speculation that U.S. judges will sound more like them if the Americans abandon reliance on history and purpose. For the teleological approach to interpretation is the principal tool of the civilian legal interpreter. Scalia was indeed correct that U.S. judges tend to sound like common law judges even when they're doing work similar to the civil law judges of the continent, but he was wrong about the reason. What actually distinguishes the common law judge making public law decisions <clears throat> and the civil law judge making public law decisions is the relentless use of judicial precedent by the former. At times, burying the statute being construed under a mountain of exegesis of the language used in judicial opinions. The quotation of Scalia that I gave before is taken from a case in which the court had to determine whether civil rights laws granting a reasonable attorney's fees, that's in quote, a reasonable attorney's fee to a party who proves that the state has violated their le le uh, federal legal rights re requires the defendant to pay not only the, the cost for the lawyer's time but also expert witness fees. An attorney's fee is ambiguous. It can refer to the balance on a bill one gets from one's lawyer or it can refer to the part of that bill that, re that, that relates to the work that the lawyer actually did. But Scalia found the language plain, and, um, and, it, it, and, and, and it isn't. It's true of, of um, genitive constructions. We have genitive case in German also, not much left anymore. Uh, general uh, possessions, in, uh, possessions in English. So if I say, I just saw your sofa in the furniture store, that can refer to the hearer's actual sofa that he or she is selling used. It can refer <clears throat> to the same model and color sofa, <clears throat> even though the person's sofa is at home. Or it can refer to a sofa that somebody wishes they could buy but they cannot afford. Oh, I really want that sofa. I just saw your sofa in another store. Scalia's main argument in this case, though, was about coherence. Many U.S. statutes that shift legal fees specifically mention expert fees as recoverable. Why, Scalia asked, should the Supreme Court construe the statute in question as intending to include expert fees when Congress did not specifically call for such reimbursement? The dissenting justices also cared about coherence. The law shifting attorney's fees was enacted to override a stingy decision by the Supreme Court that held such fees not recoverable in general. In earlier times, courts awarded attorney's fees, including expert fees, as what, they cons as what they perceived as their equitable power. It made more sense, the dissenters argued, to construe the new law as restoring the status quo than as taking away from successful civil rights litigants a benefit they once had. These arguments will all be familiar to European scholars as coherence is as important a value in civil law jurisdictions as it is in common law jurisdictions. Less familiar is reliance on what judges have said. I counted 29 citations to prior decisions in Justice Scalia's majority opinion in the attorney's fees case, including direct quotations of what earlier judges had said. The dissenting opinion written by Justice Stevens contained 14 more references to uh, judicial decisions. Civil law judges, and in particular the justices of the Court of Justice of the EU, which began with, with its civil law roots, also rely on judicial precedent. All mature legal systems abide by the rule of law value that like things should be treated alike and thus by necessity must concern themselves with how disputes of the same type have been resolved in the past. Otherwise you can't do the analysis. Uh, Reinhold uh, Zippelius' basic text on German legal methods, uh, there aren't too many that have been translated into English, I'm sorry to say, so that, that, that hits the limits of some of my sophistication with these issues. Um, where either ambiguity or gaps in the code create the need for um, interpretation, he says, in interpretation, as in the case with filling gaps, case comparison by type begins by setting apart the consistent and different deliberate, deliberative comparison with the goal in mind of treating substantially equally, equal cases equally and substantially unequal cases unequally. That's very basic, and a common law judge would say exactly the same thing using similar words. The two systems differ, however, in the degree of deference to which they give the precedent and in the formalities through which they recognize it. The CJEU frequently refers to its own prior decisions as a reason for ruling one way or the other in a case before it, as does the Supreme Court of the United States. Such precedent is referred to in the literature as horizontal precedent. <clears throat> 
Neither court is formally bound by its own decisions. Both courts reserve the right to change their minds. Like its common law counterpart, the CJEU from time to time abandons its earlier decisions, especially in cases of constitutional interpretation, treaties in the case of the CJEU, when it concludes that earlier decisions were mistaken or at least have produced unwanted, unforeseen legal consequences. Yet in general, the CJEU, like the US Supreme Court, is committed to horizontal precedent. Scholars have noted that the Treaty of Lisbon makes numerous references to the value of consistency in, e in EU law, a value that invites the CJEU and the lower courts to take into account prior judicial decisions in evaluating disputes currently before the court. While civil law judges are actually encouraged to adjust to the times, U.S. courts do so more reluctantly, but the law indeed evolves in the U.S. Um, as well, uh, not just with respect to the common law. The two systems share a second kind of precedent, vertical precedent, although to a lesser extent. A lower court must um, rule consistently with the rulings of a higher court within the same legal order. It's very formal in the United States, less so here in Europe. <clears throat> And, um, and the, the, the CJEU, though, has asserted its own right, its power to impose vertical stare decisis on the courts of member states. In a case called Kerbler in, 19, in 2003, the court established its power by declaration, holding that a member state can commit a serious breach of EU law through a decision that the state's courts are at odds with the holdings of the CJEU. It, uh, here, I'll quote from the court. In any event, an infringement of community law will be sufficiently serious where the decision of a national court concerned was made in manifest breach of the case law of the CJEU in the matter. In the US, state Supreme Courts are the final word when it comes to state law, and the US Supreme Court has the final word when it comes to federal law, including the obligations of the states to abide by the Constitution by virtue of the Constitution's supremacy clause. Within the framework of the federal courts, vertical precedent holds rigidly. The trial courts must not undermine the decisions of the courts of appeals, and neither level court may act in defiance of the rulings of the Supreme Court of the United States. There's a little bit of a trickier relationship between the state Supreme Courts and the United States Supreme Court. So the United States Supreme Court, for example, has said that the state Supreme Courts, if they're relying on their own constitutions, must state unequivocally that they're not relying on the federal constitution or the Supreme Court will draw a negative interest saying, well, even if you say that you're relying on the, on the constitution of Missouri, we think you're really relying on the US constitution and you're wrong about that. Uh, but the, Supreme, the state Supreme Courts have decided um, not to adhere to this warning because they're saying it's none of your business how we write our decisions. So the kind of federalist tension that you feel in Europe, we have a little bit up in the United States, but not as much because there's no real history of the states being um, um, autonomous to the extent that European states have been autonomous before um, the, the European uh, Union. Vertical precedent is less embedded here. Nonetheless, the courts do not, um, do not um, aggressively flout the decisions of the CJEU. And these, similar, these similarities have been noted um, in, the, in the literature on, on EU law. Um, two scholars who write together, Derlen and Lindholm, Swedish um, scholars, wrote, quote, I, the CJEU is a precedent-driven constitutional court comparable to the Supreme Court of the United States and with a comparable approach to precedent. I agree with most of that, but I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about how the, the use of precedent and the way they talk about precedent is very, very different between these two courts. Uh, when it comes to, com um, to common law, um, it's the courts that really have the last word. The, the common law is court-made law. But when it comes to statutory interpretation, um, in contrast, this is not so, or at least it's much less so. Horizontal precedent is strongest in the United States when it comes to the interpretation of statutes, weakest when it comes to constitutional law and with respect to common law. The reason for that is because of the, if the court makes a mistake with respect to a, the interpretation of a statute, the legislature can just write a new law. But the legislature can't, can't do anything about a constitutional interpretation of laws that it's made, and it can't do anything about the common law. Well, I guess it can. It can override the common law with a law. There's a, there's a principle of um, legislative supremacy. 
So there's more that it can do with that. So constitutional law has the weakest stare decisis. Statutory law has the strongest. And common law is a little bit in between. That's kind of how it works in, in, um, in, in the states. And to give you an example of super strong statutory interpretation, the case that's used in the American case books is a baseball case. It's called Flood versus Kuhn from the 1960s. Kurt Flood was a baseball player, and he wanted to go from, he was traded from one team to another, and he didn't want to sign up with that team. And, at the, and, and that would be an antitrust violation for baseball to say, no, you'll work where we tell you to work. But in the 1920s, it was held by the Supreme Court that the antitrust laws do not apply to baseball. <laughs> and the reason that for that was undoubtedly because the justices were baseball fans. They didn't want their favorite <laughs> players moving. <laughs> but it was also in part because um, the, the holding, as silly as it was in the 1920s, was that baseball is not a business engaged in interstate commerce. Tell that to the owners who are making all this money. <laughs> And so, and then that decision was upheld in the 1950s. And they have hearings in Congress once in a while, should we get rid of this exemption? So they invite their favorite baseball stars and the, and the legislators have their kids come in and they get autographs and pictures and so on. Very sophisticated um, you know, governmental system that we have. So by the time Kurt Flood challenges trade by the St. Louis Cardinals to the Philadelphia Phillies in 1969, baseball's immunity from the antitrust laws had been entrenched for half a century and reaffirmed about halfway, at the halfway point. He challenged this though, and the court decided in a mixed uh, decision, five to four, to uphold the antitrust exemption. Not because they thought it was good law back in the 20s, and it's certainly ridiculous by 1969 when it was big business, but because a great deal of reliance had occurred on that decision with respect to the entire industry of baseball, including minor league teams and a whole structure of things. And they said, you know, we just can't do anything about this anymore. Congress can work with baseball and set up a whole new system, and they probably should, but it's too late for us to do anything about it. So this last opinion um, saying, uh, relied heavily on the reliance interests that come from court decisions in saying that once we've, up, once we've said how a statute works, we're going to stick with it and let the legislature fix it with all the problems that we've caused that can fix those problems too. <clears throat> now let me talk about the style of precedent in, in both the uh, Supreme Court and, and, um, and the, um, the Court of Justice. I'm going to talk about a case called Small versus United States. There's a law that makes it a crime for a person who's been convicted in any court, that's the key, the key language, in any court of a crime punishable by more than one year to own a firearm in the, in, in the United States. So for those of you who are just getting out of prison, don't buy a firearm in the United States. And the, um, I know I didn't. And the Spall had been convicted in a Japanese court of, of illegally importing firearms into Japan. He, was, he, had, he, was, he had big boilers, hot water heaters, and he was putting rifles in them, smuggling the rifles into Japan and selling them on the black market. So when he got out of prison in Japan after a few years, he went back to the United States and bought a gun immediately. And he was, he, they found out that he did it, and he was tried and convicted of buying a firearm, um, having been convicted in any court of a crime punishable by more than one year. The case made its way to the US Supreme Court, and in the U.S. Supreme Court, um, the argument he made was that in any court must be limited to U.S. courts because criminal laws are construed as applying within the territory. And it's kind of a close case because purchasing the gun in the United States really happened in the United States, but the predicate elements did not happen in the United States. So it's a little bit different than the standard territoriality case that you see in the courts. And you have the same, the same principles in, in European codes as well. So as a linguistic matter, the case came down to the interpretation of any, in the expression, any court. So what, is the, what are the justices, and the justices decided five to four to reverse the conviction, saying that this is too extraterritorial and, and, and it doesn't apply. So what do they do? They, besides fighting over which dictionaries have the best definition of any, the justices look at cases over the centuries in which they have talked about the word any and they quote themselves verbatim. So here's one from the 18th century, 
General words such as the word any must be limited in their application to those objects which the, to which the legislature intended to apply them. Another one, any means different things depending on the setting. Another one, respondent errors in placing depositive weight on the broad statutory reference to any law enforcement officer without considering the rest of the statute, and so on. So there's a tradition of interpreting any contextually. And in another case involving any, one of the justices wrote, Justice Breyer, wrote, um, when I ask my wife if there's any butter, I don't mean is there any butter in the world. I mean is there any butter in the refrigerator. Yes. <laughs> the dissenting justices found their own any cases. So here's one. Read naturally, the word any has an expansive meaning. That is, one or some indiscriminately of whatever kind. Another one that dissent had is, um, a statute referring to any other term of imprisonment includes no language limiting the breadth of that word, and so we must read the statute as referring to all terms of imprisonment, and so on. So you have cases where the Supreme Court interpreted any broadly, and you have cases where they interpreted it contextually, and like bad lawyers who think that the judge won't read the opposing cases, the justices on the Supreme Court each cite the uses of any over a 200 year period that suits their purpose. And there's nothing unusual about that in American jurisprudence. I don't mean American jurisprudence is always that vacuous, but there's pieces of it that come through you know, quite frequently. This page flip, I, there's more examples, but I, I won't have time to give them to you. Now, <clears throat> let me talk a little bit more about, um, about a, a benevolent way, a benign way, rather, of, of, of judges using um, a, a language in this way. And by the way, this is called, what I've just been referring to, the quotation of themselves verbatim, which you don't see in the European Court of Justice, you don't see in civil law countries generally. It's called the, the textualization of precedent in an article by my um, late co-writer, Peter Tiersma. And so sometimes you see benign instances of the textualization of precedent. Namely, you see situations where, where what a judge said earlier is quoted this way because it's respected. There's nothing wrong with, with, with respecting something and using it, and that's, that you see that sometimes. So the Lanham Act is the federal trademark law. And, uh, and it says very little about the relative strength of a trademark, so not knowing how strong the mark is, it's hard to know what it takes to violate, the, to, to infringe on a trademark. But in 1976, a famous appellate judge named Henry Friendly created a hierarchy of distinctiveness from generic at one end of the spectrum to fanciful at the other, and it's still widely cited today. The case is not merely cited for its legal reasoning, the categories are quoted verbatim and have become part of the law of trademark in the United States, and, and, and uh, very comfortably. So what courts do is they substitute the, the Henry Friendly hierarchy of distinctiveness for the words in the statute and then judge the cases that way. And, and that is a, the, a kind of horizontal um, precedent because there's no reason for most courts to care what Henry Friendly said 50 years ago, since that, that particular appellate court is, doesn't even have jurisdiction over most things. And even the Supreme Court of the United States quotes them all the time. So there's an example of something where, out of respect for persuasive um, 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 precedent, the courts are, are more aggressive in, in their quotation than you would find here in Europe. But not all of it is so benign. When courts define statutory words and then later substitute an earlier court's definition for the legislative language itself, they often distort the meaning. In the philosophy of language, this is known as the pet fish problem. The prototypical pet is a dog, probably this high, maybe like in the States, everybody likes to have see an Irish setter. But a lot of, you know, like a brown dog this side that you slap. And the, and the prototypical fish is something like a trout or a salmon or a bass. It's probably about this long and classically fish-shaped. But the prototypical pet fish is not an animal that's half dog and half fish. It's a, it's a goldfish. So, um, so what we do is we combine things grammatically, pet and fish, and then after the combination, we look at what's the prototypical phrase. What is the ordinary um, use of that phrase? And it only comes after you combine them. 
The result of that is when the judges take a word out of a phrase, define it, and insert their definition instead of the word itself, there's bound to be a distortion. So the prototypical pet fish is not the sum of the prototypical pet plus the prototypical fish. Similarly, there's a statute that's, that made it a crime. If you use a gun in a drug crime, you get an enhanced sentence. So they, interpret, they took the word use out of that, substituted a definition, and put it back in without thinking that you first have to look at the combination of use and gun, and then look at the ordinary meaning of the phrase. So there, the court frequently creates pet fish problems when it quotes itself by substituting its own words for the words that the legislature used. They do it by accident, but they do it. <laughs> now, constitutional decisions also get textualized. So in First Amendment law, there's a, uh, which is a right to free speech, there's a, um, there's a, there's a, there's a case called Lemon versus, um, uh, Lemon versus Kurtzman, a 1971 case, very famous, it's cited all the time. And the justice has said, three, three such cases may be gleaned from our cases. First, the statute must have a secular, this is about religion, a secular legislative purpose. Second, its principal or primary effect must be one that neither advances nor inhibits religion. Finally, the statute must not foster an excessive government entanglement with religion. Now, there's a lot of problems with the, the, these three lemon tests, but nonetheless, it's cited all the time as a, as a launching pad for further discussion. Now, if you look up, uh, if you look up some of the language in this in Westlaw or Lexis, you find hundreds and hundreds of references by the courts of the word lemon within excessive government entanglement, for example. So this is quoted all the time as a substitute for the actual language of the religion clauses in the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. Very typical kind of argumentation that you see. Um, now, before I get to the EU, I want to mention something else about, about uh, Great Britain. The United Kingdom has a, has a custom in appellate decisions of, of having the court state the facts, and then the justices write small comments as to how they're voting and why. And they call these serial opinions. Serial opinions means that you could have four, five, or six little snippets of discussion and as the decision of the case, they just count the votes. When you have that kind of situation, you don't have a single opinion, you don't have a single text. It's exactly like the EU, but instead you just have individual decisions instead of having different language versions. But you wind up with the same problem if you want to textualize. You can't. So sometimes English courts will cite, will just quote the whole thing, and sometimes they'll quote nothing. But they don't just take little bits of it and say, Judge so-and-so said this and Judge so-and-so said that, because they're not speaking on behalf of the whole court. That, that tradition died in 1801 in the United States, and it's not fully flourishing now in, 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 in um, the United Kingdom, but it's still alive and you still see it. So you see much less textualization of precedent in, um, in the UK than you do in the United States. Um, as for, um, for Europe, it's not clear to me that you, that you need the, the, um, the explanation I'm about to give based on multilingualism, but you have the same kind of situation where when you have 24 different versions of, of a judicial decision and, and the language is written differently, even if the gist is the same and you know what your obligations and rights are after it's done, it's kind of hard to know what to quote. So in addition to the civil law tradition, not having this kind of textualization just as part of the tradition because of a, of, of a reduced um, prestige of, of, of judicial precedent in the system altogether, you have the issue of multilingualism. So as, this, as the Court of Justice of the EU looks more like a common law court to, um, to especially to the European um, sensibility, it doesn't sound like a common law court. And in, some, and, and in that way, it really isn't a common law court. Finally, let me just say that I've, I've done some research with my um, research assistants looking at, how they, uh, looking at expressions like settled case law in the Court of Justice of the EU. They love that expression. They almost never used it through the 1980s. But beginning in about 1994, they started using it a lot. So you would see it used 20 or 30 times a year 
in, uh, up until 1993, 94, and now you see it used hundreds of times a year. So the, so the court of justice began to recognize itself as a court with this kind of, um, of, of precedential um, authority and became comfortable in its own skin as time went on, and still is for that matter. It's not comfortable about everything, but it's certainly comfortable about that, about, about continuing to claim the power that it, that, that it, it identified for itself earlier. Um, and you also see uh, one other difference, and, and then I'm going to finish. Um, there's, there's a kind of precedent that, that in, the, in the American um, jurisprudence is called methodological precedent. Here's how you go about construing laws. Here's how you go about construing the Constitution. There is no consensus about any of that in American jurisprudence. The judges practically call each other names. I can't believe that we don't know even now how to do this or that. And there's, there's angry discourse about that. But they're still, they then go into detail about the language issues, much less so in, in the court of justice, where the court um, has reasonably strong agreement on methodology in the general sense, but then starts disagreeing if they disagree at all. The disagreements are not transparent in that court, as you know. Uh, but if there's any disagreement, it would have to do with the nitty gritty. So it's really, it's really quite the opposite. There's a well-known case um, called Silflet, Silfit many years ago where the court said we look at many language versions and we, um, and we triangulate. And, 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 and they do that. There's criticism that they don't do enough of it. There's criticism that they do too much of it, but they do it. Well, returning to the overall uh, theme of this um, presentation, uh, to, to conclude, um, I want to tell a personal story uh, from my youth. When I was a teenager in the 1960s, like many people my age, I had very long hair, and I had an aunt who once approached me and said, Larry, you know, you really have to learn how to have the long hair look without long hair. <laughs> That's what the court of justice is doing. They're, they have the common law look, but it's not a common law court. Thank you. <laughs>